morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath once again. Many of you heard the saying, one place, everyone here has heard it. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. We've all heard this, right? I've been hearing it pretty much my whole life. You see, I was raised, I was raised a Christian. And being raised in a Christian home, I've heard this time and time again. Week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. Jesus is coming soon. Well, I'm now 47 years old, and Jesus still hasn't arrived. Since I've heard this for so long, for a while, it has lost its effect on me. It didn't have quite the same effect as it did when I was growing up. So whenever I heard someone say this, I would say to myself, yeah, right, you know, he's coming, I've heard, I've heard it a million times. He's not coming anytime soon. But it wasn't until 10 years, about 10 years ago, or maybe even less, I've noticed a change has been happening. But it's not just me that have been noticing it. Other Christians have been noticing it. And not just me and other Christians, but even the non-Christians are noticing that something is happening. You hear, you hear people say, what's happening to this world? This world is changing. Well, this world is indeed changing. And something is happening. It's preparing itself for the arrival of Jesus. So this morning, I'm going to tell you what I've been hearing all, pretty much all my life. Jesus is truly coming soon. Yeah. If you remember in, in, in the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 24, Matthew, chapter 24, Jesus' disciple came to Jesus and they asked Jesus, what will be the sign of the end of the age? And Jesus tells them, and it's thought again, verse 4. He says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, or pay attention, that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For the nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, if you look at the news, doesn't that sound like what's happening now? What Jesus said 2,000 years ago is pretty much what's happening now. Look at, just turn on any channel in the news and you see it. It says here that um, you hear wars and rumors of wars. Within the past century, this past century, I would say, has been the century that has been most filled with wars. We've had World War I, we had World War II, we had the, the, the Vietnam, we had the Korean War, we had the Persian, the, the Gulf War, we, and, and, and so on and so forth. Then we have, he says also, I lost my place here. That there shall be famines. There shall be famines. Now, when we speak of famines, what's the first place we think of when we speak of famines? We right away we speak of famine, we think of hunger, right? And we think of Africa. But we don't have to think of Africa. Just look at his own country. This country is supposed to be a rich country, and we have people starving and homeless in this country. Then we have pestilences, which are diseases and all these kinds of other stuff. We see in this country and all over the world that our medicine has been so far advanced, but yet we're more sick now than we were at creation. Why is that? If we're so technically advanced, why are we so sick? I, I, I'm pretty sure that most of us here have, are under prescription medication. I'm not going to ask who, but I'm pretty sure most, a lot of us are. Why is that? Those are signs of what Jesus told us are going to be happening. Then it says earthquakes. There'll be earthquakes. 
Now you're probably saying, okay, Robert, well, we've had earthquakes all throughout, all throughout our history. Yes, we have had earthquakes. But if you notice, the earthquakes are happening more often. And as they're happening more often, their intensity is increasing. And not just, not just the earthquakes, but even the storms that we're having. The rains, we're having rains that are flooding the country and all parts of the world. We have fires, we have the, the hurricanes. You see the hurricanes, they're not saying out they're just hurricanes, they're, they're super hurricanes. If you look at, at the news, when they, when they give a picture of the satellite, the things are massive. Those hurricanes are getting bigger and more destructive. These are signs that Jesus gave us, signs that we see right now. And if you're still not convinced, just look at what's been happening lately in the news. We pretty much have the, the east coast of this country pretty much drowning, and we have the west coast burning up. Signs that are happening. Ready or not, believe it or not, it's happening. Let us be watching and let us be ready that we won't be surprised when Jesus comes. Let us bow our heads and pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, Father, I ask that you be with me, Father. Fill me with your spirit, Father. Let, let my words be your words. Let this message, Father, be a blessing to everyone here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The title for this morning's uh, message is called The Great Controversy. Many of us, if not all of us, are familiar with this topic. So today's message is going to be hopefully a refresher for us. Hopefully at the end of this message, you will want to go home and, and, and restudy this again. The Great Controversy. Who is this great controversy with? It's with Christ and with Satan. Now how did this controversy come about? Turn with me to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, starting with verse 13. And it said, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou was created. Thou art the anointing cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon thy holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee out as the profane of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, which is the earth, and I will lay thee before kings that, the, that they may behold thee. So we see here that Lucifer was a beautiful angel. He was all decked out with precious stones, and he was one of the two covering cherubs whose dwelling place was right next to God until iniquity was found in him. Turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. And it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How thou cut down to the ground, which didst wake in the nation? Thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the midst of the north. I will ascend the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. <coughs> Lucifer wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be like God, which is what led to his rebellion and him being cast out of heaven. But now wait a second. What about in the book of Job, where it says that the sons of God 
came to present themselves before the Lord. Was he sitting there too? Wasn't he there with them? Well, when God made a man, he gave man dominion over the earth. And when man fell to Satan's temptations, man's dominion over the earth now went to Satan, which gave him access back into heaven. And it made him the ruler of this world. But Satan also will lose this dominion. Remember when John the Baptist preached? What did he say when he preached? What was, the, what was recorded in the Bible as him saying? He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Isn't that what he said? After Christ was baptized and tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, he also began to preach. And what did Jesus say? Jesus also said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now what did they mean by that? What, were they, what did they mean by the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, it meant that Satan's dominion was coming to an end. Turn with me now to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. And this is the chapter where we all go to when we first hear about the great controversy. We all turn to, to this chapter. In, in, in this chapter, it gives us a summary of the great controversy. And this chapter is divided into three sections. The first section is from verses 1 to 6. Here we see a woman who is with child, which represents the church and Jesus. Then we have a great red dragon, which drew a third part of the stars of heaven, which represents Satan and his fallen angels. They stand, they stand before the woman, ready to devour her child, and as soon, as soon as it was born. This we know represents the time when Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had to, take, had to, had to flee because Herod had given an order to kill the children, all the children that were two years and under. Then we have a man-child who was caught up unto God and to his throne, which represents Jesus when he resurrected and was brought up to heaven who is now our king and our priest. And in verse 6, we have the woman who fled into the wilderness for 1260 days, which represents the Dark Ages, when the church was being persecuted from 538 AD to 1798. Now I'm going to read now the verses 7 to 12, in chapter 12, chapter 12 of Revelation chapter 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and he pre and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the dragon was caught out. The dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in saying, in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, and to the sea. For the devil comes down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that time is, is a short time. So here we have a summary. Here we have a summary of what happened when Christ ascended into heaven. There was war in heaven. But this isn't the type of war that we used to see in here. There were no bombings, there were no killings, or anything of that nature. This we know because Satan, is, his Satan and his angels are here. We can have this on all of us. So we know that that wasn't the case. The war that, that it was in heaven, I imagine was a, was a type of war that we have, like, let's say with our family members. You know, when we argue with each other, what do we say? Oh, this means war, this means war. That, I guess, is the type of war that they had.
They said things to each other and they didn't hold back. Satan knew he was defeated and he went to war. He let it all out and he still was defeated. And this time he was cast out of heaven for good. And notice what it says in verse 10. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. A kingdom. Now if this happened in heaven, wasn't the king, isn't there really a kingdom exist? So what kingdom is meant here? What kingdom did they mean from, from this? This is, the king, this is the kingdom that John the Baptist was preaching, when he, and Jesus was also preaching, when he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This kingdom that is being referred to is the kingdom of grace. Turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now go to verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help you in a time of need. So we see here that if there's a throne of grace, there's a, there must be a kingdom. Now the last section of Revelation 12 talks about what Satan did when he was cast down to earth. He persecuted the woman, which is the church, and history shows that for the first 300 plus years, the Christians were being killed left and right. But the more Christians that were being killed, the more were being converted to Christianity. We see that in history. The more, the more that they were persecuted, the more they were, they were multiplying. I imagine saying, saying to himself, well, what is it with these Christians? You know, I keep killing these Christians and they keep multiplying. They're like rabbits. What's wrong with these Christians? So I know, Satan must be saying, okay, well, if I can't beat them, I'll join them. And that's exactly what happened in the time of Constantine with the rise of the Catholic Church. Now, does anybody know what, what the word Catholic means? Does anybody know what that word means? The word Catholic means universal. And that's exactly what Constantine wanted. He wanted a universal religion so that they all can get along. Although he probably meant well, this was a huge mistake because by doing this, it gave Satan the opportunity to cast water out of his mouth as a flood, like it says in verse 15. In other words, it gave Satan the opportunity to bring in deception and false teaching, so much so that the truth would be cast away. But the earth, which represents the United States, helped the church by swallowing up the flood of deception and persecution. This we know happened when, when, when the settlers came from Europe and they came to this country. They came here because of what? Because they wanted freedom of religion. They wanted the separation of church and state. Which brings us now to our present age. So what happens next? We've all heard the saying that what we find in the New Testament, the teaching we find in the New Testament, we can also find in the Old Testament. Have you heard that before? So what, are, what other chapter in the Bible speaks about the gay controversy? How about Daniel chapter 3? Did you see any similarities there between Daniel chapter 3 and Revelation 12? Daniel 3 is about Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon. In Revelation 18, what does Babylon represent? In, in Revelation 18, it represents the false church. So Daniel chapter 3 is about a false church, and I guess you can say that the three Hebrews also represent a church. After all, they did worship the true God. And what is this great controversy between Nebuchadnezzar and the three Hebrews? It's about worship, just like, just like it was in heaven. You see, Daniel chapter 3 is a counterfeit of Revelation 12. Are you starting to see the similarities? 
Now, as I go to Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to give you more or less teasers. Because I want you, I want you to, to go home and restudy this again. It's an amazing study. And you'll see that it pertains to what we are in and now. So we hear in, um, in, in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes an image 60 cubits high. Why make an image so high? You know, the Babylonians, they had images and idols all over the place. You know, they could have just taken any one of them and, and, and make an example out of it. Why make something so high? My brother, Jacques Dukan, in his book, Secrets of Daniel, he writes on page 46, he writes, in the Babylonian numerical symbolism, 60 represents notion of unity. In erecting his statue to be a height of 60 cubits, Nebuchadnezzar seeks primarily to enforce his will for unity, for one kingdom, one religion. So Nebuchadnezzar wanted unity. When Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, did he gather all the people of the kingdom? Was it everybody that, that came to, to be gathered? No, he didn't invite everyone. He gathered only the rulers and the officials of the, of the kingdom to come and worship the image. Now why would he do something like that? Why, why not bring anybody? If he wants to show his power, why not bring anybody? Why bring just the, 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 the rulers and officials? And also, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to worship the image, why was Nebuchadnezzar so full of fury? Nebuchadnezzar responded to these three Hebrews. Why was he so full of rage when, when, when they said they weren't going to bow down? Well, sometime in the 19th century, some artifacts were found in which writings of Nebuchadnezzar's first 11 years were recorded. And it's known as the Jerusalem Chronicles. And it wasn't until around 1956 that the Jerusalem Chronicle was deciphered. Something interesting happened in the 10th year of his reign. I went online and I downloaded the Jerusalem Chronicle. And it shows here in, 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 the, in Nebuchadnezzar's 10th year, it says, In the 10th year, the king of Akkad, which is Babylon, was in his old land from the month of Kislimu, the month of Tibetu, there was rebellion in Akkad, which is Babylon. With arms, he slew many of his own army, his own hand captured his enemy. So we see here, that there was war in Babylon, just like there was war in heaven. This explains why Nebuchadnezzar was so upset and he only gathered the rulers and officials. They were the biggest threat to his kingdom and he wanted unity. Now, now wait a second. How do we know that what's, what's uh, in these artifacts and what's in the Bible happened around the same time? How many of you are familiar with, with Josephus? He's a Jewish historian. He was alive at the time of Jerusalem when it was destroyed in 70 AD. And the discovery of the Jerusalem Chronicle was still some 1700 or 1800 years in the future. And they were, had already been lost and buried before. He says, uh, he writes here. He says, but when Nebuchadnezzar had already reigned four years, so Nebuchadnezzar's fourth year of reign, which was the eighth of Jehoiakim, who was the king of Judah. He went over to the Hebrews, the king of Babylon, made an expedition with mighty forces against the king of Jews, and required tribute of Jehoiakim, and threatened on his refusal to make war against him. He was affrighted at his threatening, and brought his peace with money, and brought the tribute he ordered to bring for three years. But on the third year, which would be Nebuchadnezzar's seventh year, upon hearing that the Babylonians made an expedition against the Egyptians, he did not pay his tribute. So this we know was Nebuchadnezzar's seventh year and Jehoiakim's eleventh year, which we know the Bible says that Jehoiakim only reigned for eleven years. So here we see Josephus writing the end of Jehoiakim's, Jehoiakim's reign. 
And it's written here that in the seventh year, the seventh year of um, Nebuchadnezzar, it is recorded that in the month of Kislimu, the king of, the king of Akkad, which is Babylon, must have his troops and march to the Hadiland, which is Assyria, and besieged the city of Judah on the second day and month of Adaru. He seized the city and captured the king. Now these are writings that the Babylonians wrote on the tablets that they have found and, and has been deciphered. So with the finding of these tablets, we see that we, we get a little better understanding of what happened in Daniel chapter 3. Revelation 12 ended with the church being persecuted. And now we come to the part where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are also being persecuted. And something amazing happened to these three Hebrews. As we know, it will happen also to us as well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told that if they don't bow down and worship the king, the, the image, that they will be cast into the burning fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand their ground and do not worship the image. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 to 25. Now as I read these verses, pay close attention to what's happening here. And tell me if you notice or, or if you see what I saw. Now at first, at first I didn't see it right away. It took me a few tries. But when I know when I after I noticed that, I said to myself, wow, this is amazing. It's amazing. This has been here all this time. And I haven't noticed it. Verse 19. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and the form of his visage changed again Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the Most High, he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was so urgent, the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who took up, who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. And he rose up in haste and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lord, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Did you see anything familiar in these verses? She's shaking her head, yes. What did you see? Did you see anything? No? Huh? No, I heard you translate whether you say to Chinese for my wife. Okay. Right. So at first, when I first read this, I must have read these. Um, I must have read these these verses a ton of times, and I never noticed it. And it wasn't until recently that I noticed what's in there, and I find it amazing. See, I'm, I'm the type of person that I don't like to read. And as I was telling my brother before, before we walked in, I just grew up as a Christian. And I spent some time, there was a time in my life for about 10, 15 years where I left the church because I was a study and I was deceived. But then when I came back, when I came back, I said, God, I want things to be different this time. So now I'm, I want to make an honest effort and I want to study. 
but I want you to show me things. And in return, when you show me things, I will share it. Now, as I was talking to my brother, I thought I was going to be sharing this one-on-one -on -one with people. I had no idea I was going to be preaching. But if that's what God wanted me to do, that's what I'm going to do. He kept his promise, and I got to keep mine. I've been studying, and he's been showing. And like I said before, this is, to me, this, I thought this was amazing. If you don't see it, I'll give you a hint. And it's called, the, and it's found in, uh, the hint is found in Psalms 50, Psalms 50, verse 3. Psalms 50, verse 3. And it says, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous around him. Did you not see what's happening in, in Daniel? What's happening with, with, the, with the furnace and the three Hebrews? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are bound. Okay? They're bound. Just like we are bound for sin. They are taken up to the furnace, right? They're taken up. And who's waiting for them in the furnace? Jesus, they're bound and are being taken up. And they find Jesus when they're taken up. And in the twinkling of an eye, what happens to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They are free from what's binding them and are able to stand in the presence of Jesus while they become as men perish as they approach. Did you see now what's going on in these verses? Do you see it? It's the second coming of Jesus in miniature. It's been in Daniel chapter 3 all this time, and I never noticed it. It's amazing. I thought that was amazing. My brothers and sisters, we should be paying more attention to what's happening. We should be paying more attention to what's happening all around us. We should be paying more attention to what's in here. Because Jesus gave us warnings of stuff that's happening before he comes. And if we watch, if we watch and see what's happening in the world around us, we see that the time is near. We see that it's near. What we just saw was a tiny glimpse of the second coming of Jesus. My brothers and sisters, the great controversy between Christ and Satan is almost over. Soon Christ will be coming to claim those who accepted his gift. Would you be like Nebuchadnezzar, like Nebuchadnezzar's men who perished before the Lord? Or will you, in the twinkling of an eye, be transformed and be with Jesus forever? May the Lord bless you.
are in heaven. Lord, thank you for this message, Father. Father, I hope that this message will inspire people to go home and, and restudy this, this, this message again. A wonderful, wonderful study, Father. Father, may they, may they all be blessed in this, in, with this message. And Father, you truly are coming soon. We see that from the, all that's happening around us. We truly see that you are coming soon. And soon, we won't have to pray, but we'll be talking to you face to face. Soon, this controversy will be over, Father, and we'll be with you forever. Father, help us to get ready for that great and wonderful day when you come to get us. Thank you, Father. Come soon. Please come soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.